for Cali. Oh, really? Yeah. So I, I adjusted yeah. that. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Check, check, test one, two, check one, check one, two, test one, two, checking one, two, three, test one, loop check, test one, two, check, 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 test one, two, check one, two, three, test, check one, test one, two, check one, check one, check, check, one, two, check one. Check one, two, check, check one, two, test one, two, three, check. Check one, two. Test one, check one, check one. Test. Check one, test. Check one. Test, test, one, two, check.
Amen. Jesus says, I am coming soon. Good morning and welcome to worship on this third Sunday in Advent. It's wonderful to have you with us. Um, faces both, both new and old, and it's great to uh, just to see you all here. Katie has a uh, minute for mission for us. Hello, everybody. So next Monday is Christmas Eve, right? Christmas Eve. And so for the intergenerational service, we are doing what is called a Chris Tingle service, which is a Moravian tradition. And uh, it's a Moravian tradition or a Moravian candlelit service. Um, that requires a, um, a simple craft to be made with oranges and candlesticks. And next week, after worship, we, you are all invited to help us create all of these lovely uh, candles to hand out to those who attend the, uh, the Christingo service on Christmas Eve. So I would appreciate any, uh, any sort of help. It is a, it'll be fun, and it'll be simple. You do not have to be crafty as long as you can, um, can poke an orange with a, with a toothpick. You, uh, you have the, skills, the skill set. So, um, so yeah, so I, just, uh, I would like to invite you guys to be a part of, a part of that, that opportunity next week after worship. So thank you. And you'll finish up and you'll smell wonderful. I <laughs> uh, would also like to remind those who are our uh, new officers for 2019 that we will have our final new officer training after worship uh, downstairs in the lower level. And also would like to point out that this morning we are receiving our Christmas joy offering. You'll see these purple envelopes in the pews. The Christmas Joy Offering is one that our denomination collects uh, primarily to help out pastors and church workers who uh, find themselves in difficult situations without the financial resources they need, either for, for medical care or for um, relocation, things of that sort. And, um, you know, here, here in this congregation, you all take wonderful care of me. Okay? And not every congregation is able to do that for their pastor. And so sometimes pastors find themselves in difficult situations, and this is an opportunity for us to help the wider church uh, with that. So would invite you, if you feel so moved, to um, put something in a, in a purple envelope uh, aside from your normal offering. And with that... Let us continue our worship as we listen to our prelude this morning.
Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. God, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. So please rise in body or in spirit as we sing the opening hymn number 41, O Come All Ye Faithful. joyful and triumphant. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. In this well-known and beloved Christmas hymn, we are invited as God's faithful people to go to Bethlehem and endure Christ the Lord. We sing words borrowed from the Nicene Creed to express the Christian faith about the Incarnation. After exhorting the angels to sing their praise, we greet Christ on his birthday. There is a sense of urgency to this hymn. Imagine someone dragging you by the hand as you run through a crowd, saying over and over again, Come, we are told that patience is a virtue, but who could stand by and wait when, we, when all we want to do is worship our Lord and Savior? This hymn takes us by the hand and leads us with triumphant song to Bethlehem, shows us the infant Jesus, and invites 
us to sing with the angels, sing with our families, sing with our fellow believers, sing with every fiber of our being, and worship Christ the Lord. As we light this third candle of Advent, let us remember who this baby in the major really is. He is God of God, light of light eternal, son of father, word of father and flesh, and Christ the Lord. Brothers and sisters, the hymn we just sang says, O come, all ye faithful. And sometimes we are hesitant because we know that we aren't always faithful. And yet we come before God in confession of where our faith is faltered because confession is itself an act of faith, trusting in the God who loves us and forgives us and welcomes us home no matter what. So let us confess our faith before God and one another, first silently and then using the prayer printed in the bulletin. And praying together, Lord, we have not kept watch for you, We have occupied ourselves with our own concerns. We have not waited to find your will for us. We have not noticed the needs of the people around us. We have not acknowledged the love that has been shown to us. Forgive us for our lack of watchfulness. Help us to wait to know your will. Help us to look out for the needs of others. Help us to work and watch for your coming. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news from the Psalms. Surely God's salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. In Christ, God's salvation is at hand, and righteousness has come. So now, beloved, let us love one another, for the love is from God. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Also with you.
May I have the children come forward and anybody who desires to be young at heart. Actually, I'm going to have you guys sit over here by the nativity today. We're mixing things up a little bit. Okay. Okay. So, I have a question for you. And it's not, it's not a hard question, I promise. I know I can sometimes ask hard questions. So, what is your favorite... Uh, favorite way to celebrate Christmas? What's your favorite Christmas tradition or thing to do to celebrate Christmas? Or one of your favorite things? I know it's hard to pick. We go to church every Christmas Eve. That's a, you go to church every Christmas Eve? That's a good way to celebrate. We make Christmas food. <laughs> you make Christmas food. Mrs. Bodzik, or Kat, do, you, do you have a, a favorite Christmas tradition? Putting my crush up. My favorite Christmas tradition, I love seeing the Christmas lights. That's my favorite thing. Um, when I was younger, I would go to Christmas at my grandma's church every year, and after church we would go, where we'd take a drive along the lakeshore, and there's this one tree, and the house only had one tree that was that was lit up, and but they, they took these white lights and they strung them all around the tree and it looked like icicles on the tree. It was so pretty. They did it every year. I'm sure they still do it. But, so there's a lot of different ways that we celebrate. There, that we celebrate the, the birth of Jesus. We, we, put our, our, we put our crushes up, we put our nativities up, we come to church on Christmas Eve, we put up decorations, we make special food. All of these are ways that we choose to, to celebrate the coming of Jesus. And so today, our, our hymn that we are focusing on, our Christmas carol, is O Come All Ye Faithful. So we just sung that, and the words are O Come All Ye Faithful, Joyful and Triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. And so to me, when I hear this, I see this as a big invitation to, to come and to celebrate and to be a part of all of the celebrations and the joy and the goodness that Christ brings into the world. Not just to the, the birthday party or the birthday celebration, or the celebration, the Christmas celebration, but an invitation to partake in the goodness of, of God's kingdom. And so I want to, so my, my takeaway for today is, is that uh, you will know that you are invited, that you have a place in God's kingdom, you have a place here, and you always have a, and you have a seat at the table. So uh, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for inviting us to be a part of this miraculous celebration. Thank you for the coming of your son and for the promise of, um, of his coming again. In your name we pray, amen. Please listen to the prayer of illumination. God of the universe, revealed to us in Holy Scripture through the writings of the prophets and the preaching of John the Baptist, you have called us to prepare our hearts for your visitation. Ready us now to hear your word and to respond as faithful servants to the glory of Christ. Amen. Our Old Testament reading uh, comes from Jeremiah 33, verses 14 through 22, and if you'd like to follow along in the uh, Pew Bible, it's on page uh, 647. I would also point out uh, that every week, as you know, Kip puts in the Sunday bulletin points to ponder, and they're not, they're not there because he, he uh, just 
wants to take the time to just for us to read the points and ponder, but not really point, ponder the points that he's, or you know what I mean. But what we do in our household is we take them home and we reread the Old Testament, and then we also reread the Gospel. We take the, uh, the points to ponder, and, and that helps instruct us in how we're reading. And in uh, uh, Jeremiah, the first one is, how will God fulfill the promises made to uh, Judah and Israel? And I will help you today uh, in that regard. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah's personal life and struggles are known to all of us. And they're in greater depth and detail, really, than any of the other Old Testament prophets. And he lived around 600 BC. In today's passage, the armies of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, are advancing on Jerusalem. The worst has not yet happened. But it is inevitable. Jeremiah's many prophecies of judgment, prophecies that have landed him in prison, are coming true. Yet now, in the midst of catastrophe, the prophet finally speaks words of promise. And this is interpreted to be speaking about the coming ideal ruler, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So hear the, uh, the word of the Lord from the prophet Jeremiah. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promises I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord our righteous Savior. For this is what the Lord says, David will never fail to have a man to sit on the throne of Israel, nor will a Levitical priest ever fail to have a man to stand before me continually to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to present sacrifices. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, and this is what the Lord says. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that day and night no longer come at their appointed time, Then my covenant with David, my servant, and my covenant with the Levites, who are priests minister before me, can be broken, and David will no longer have a descendant to reign on this throne, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies, and to, oops, excuse me. I will make the descendants of David my servants, and the Levites, who will minister before me as countless as the stars in the sky, and as meaningless as the stand on the seashore. The word of God for the people of God. The gospel reading, very familiar, comes from Luke 1, uh, verses 67 through 75, and you can follow along on page 831. Uh, We all know this story. Uh, The father of John the Baptist was the priest at Zechariah. And when John was named, Zechariah spoke for the first time since John was conceived. This him uh, uh, appears as the report written probably by Zechariah himself of the praises that had been uttered in the first moments of his recovered gift of speech. As such, we may think of it as expressing the pent-up thoughts out of the mouth of silence that he had endured for months. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. John's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through the holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father, Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. See, 
One, one slight correction, David. The, uh, the points to ponder have actually been written by Katie for some time. Um, so um, I don't want to take credit where credit is not due. But our uh, epistle reading this morning comes from the book of Hebrews. We are reading from the first chapter, reading the first six verses. So let us attend to the word of God for us this morning. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Would you please pray with me? Gracious God, Open our ears, our minds, and our hearts that the words I speak may come from you and be filtered uh, through your spirit. That only what is yours might take root and what is not from you might be discarded. And fill us with the joy of your presence. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I want to start by saying if you look at the title of the sermon in the bulletin and you're, and you're listening to the sermon and trying to figure out what it has to do with the title, um, you will not find a connection, okay? <laughs> um, that title came about, oh, a month ago, um, and, and the Spirit's led in a different direction. So you, so you can think of this sermon as simply be adore him. Yeah. So as I was uh, preparing here is thinking about the fact that, as, as I think all of you know, um, we have two daughters. Okay? Well, actually, now we have three daughters because we have one by marriage um, and two sons, one God gave us and one by marriage that God gave us that way. Um, but our two daughters, they both attended Central College in Pella, Iowa. Okay? Central College is a, a Reformed Church of America affiliated school. And they both went there all four years in this little Dutch town of of Pella. And both of our daughters were in the choir. Um, In fact, if I can brag a little bit, they both had vocal scholarships, even though they weren't uh, music majors. Uh, But they sang in the choir. And every year, uh, the Central Choirs had a a big Christmas concert. They called it their candlelight uh, concert. And the music was wonderful. They had uh, pieces that were by the, the whole large choir, some that were by a smaller choir, um, some that were from faculty. Okay. And then they also invited the congregation or the audience to join in on some well-known Christmas carols. Okay. One of which we sang every year, so eight years we, we went and did this, and we sang, O Come All Ye Faithful. Now, this is a hymn that that I have known as long as I can remember. The first time I remember hearing O Come All Ye Faithful was on the Bing Crosby Christmas album, okay? (laughs) Adeste Fidelis, right? And we sang it, you know, probably every year in in church. And so it was a well-known hymn, a well-known carol, and yet when we were at that concert in uh, in Pella, Iowa, every year, I, I found out there was a verse I didn't know that we had never sung. This hymn was originally written in about 1740 or so, and it was written in Latin, 
Yeah. And the, the, uh, the composer included as the second verse a verse that goes, uh, God of God and light of light eternal, lo, he abhors not the virgin's womb, very God begotten, not created. O come, let us adore him. Now, I have no idea why that is not included in our hymnal or in most of the hymnals out there. But it's words that come right from the Nicene Creed reminding us who this one is whose birth we celebrate. Reminding us of that invitation to come and adore him. It's fascinating as you listen to this hymn that it's all about who Jesus is and very little about what Jesus does. It echoes what our our text says that the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. We see who Jesus is and we are invited to come and adore him, to come and worship. It is what happened starting right at the beginning. On that night in which Jesus was born, the shepherds came and worshipped. And a little while later, wise men from the east came and worshipped. And we're told that that all the angels of heaven worshipped him. We are called to to worship this one, this one who is our God in the flesh. And when we ask, well, what what does it mean to worship? Why do we worship? I think sometimes we we get things mixed up. Sometimes we focus on worshiping Jesus because of what he has done and what he does for us, rather than who he is. As I was prepping this week, I was thinking about how, how would I feel if I were Jesus? And, and the only time people came to me was for what I could do for them. We've all experienced that, haven't we? We all have people we know who, the only time we see them, the only time they bother with us is when they need something, when we can do something for them. And it's nice to be able to do things for others. But isn't it nice to have somebody who loves you just for you? Who just wants to spend time with you and get to know you? Who cares about who you are rather than what you do? Our worship should be the same way. That we worship Jesus for who he is rather than for what he does for us. There was a report that came out some years uh, ago where they did a a major uh, study on the spiritual lives of American teenagers. Kind of sounds like a reality show, doesn't it? But um, but they they did this huge study on the spiritual life of American teenagers. And and one of the things they, they found is that American teenagers often talked as though they were Christian, but their Christianity was not really the faith that we are taught, that has been handed down to us. One author refers to to that situation as being almost Christian. The studies uh, concluded that that this faith that is characterized, uh, that characterizes the, the faith of American teenagers by and large is something they call moralistic therapeutic deism. And you may have heard me mention that before. It's kind of a mouthful, right? Moralistic therapeutic deism. And the idea there is that if we live good lives and if we're kind to others, then then God's going to provide therapeutic benefits, okay? So God cares about our behavior, our morals, and he's there to be 
therapeutic, to make us feel good, to help with our, our self-esteem and our happiness. But other than that, God's not real involved in the world. And if we view God that way, as someone who is beneficial to us, okay, well, that certainly affects our prayer life. Right? The study found that, that in fact, uh, American teenagers prayed a lot. 40% said that they pray every day. There were only 15% of teenagers who said that they never prayed. But their motivation for prayer was largely focused on meeting their own needs. When they talked to the, these teenagers about their prayer lives, they got comments like this. If I ever have a problem, I go pray. It helps me to deal with problems. It, it calms me down for the most part. Or praying just makes me feel more secure, like there's something there helping me out. And one who said, I would say prayer is an essential part of my success. Okay. Do you notice how often the personal pronoun is there? <laughs> I, me, my. Okay. And the thing about their prayer life these American teenagers, is guess where they learned it, right? They get it from their parents, from their church leaders, yeah. from their Sunday school teachers, from their pastors. Yeah. This idea that God is there for our benefit. In that prayer, there is no sense of, of repentance, and there is no adoration. We are called to, to worship, to adore our God. Okay. Not simply to, to come to him when we have a need. Right. God is, is worthy of our worship. Okay. Jesus is worthy of our worship. He is the one through whom everything was made. He is the one who by the word of his power sustains all things. He is worthy of our worship, and we were created for that. Okay. And so sometimes we worship out of a sense of duty. Okay. That, well, we're, we're supposed to do this, so we do. And that is, I mean, it is true. We have a, a duty to worship God. Okay. But there's a difference between that kind of worship and adoring him. That's what I love about this hymn. The invitation is to come and adore him. Sometimes our sense of duty will bring us to worship, but then we find that adoration follows. There was a, a TV commercial out a little while ago. Perhaps you have seen it. It has a, a young man who is of Indian descent, that is of uh, Asian Indian descent. And he uh, is, is struggling because he's trying to decide whether to go through with a, an arranged marriage. Okay. That is the, the culture in the country he came from. It's the culture in India that, that marriages are arranged. That's the norm. But after living in America, he was, he was hesitant about that, having second thoughts, especially since he had never met or even seen this woman. And yet, in his sense of duty, he shows up at the airport as she is about to arrive with flowers in hand and a, a determined, if somewhat gloomy, expression on his face. Okay. And then when she walks through the terminal, he sees her and everything changes because she is beautiful. She is, is engaging. Suddenly his glum demeanor just disappears and, and the thought of marrying this woman is no longer a dreaded duty. It's a delight. It's a delight because he has seen her. The idea of a, a deistic God, a God who is not engaged with us, is a God we may have a duty to worship, but we haven't seen this God but we see God in the face of Jesus Christ. Okay? And when we see God, 
We see God's character in Jesus. Okay? Then worshiping him is no longer just a duty. It's a delight. We adore him. We long to be in his presence. We long to be with others who adore him. Okay. It's the difference between, between looking at God as someone who is there to serve us, to meet our needs, and looking at God as someone for us to serve. Okay. Tim Keller had a, <clears throat> a quote I saw recently where he said, lust says, how can you help me? Love says, how can I help you? We are not called to lust after God, looking for how he can help us, but to love him and ask how we can love and serve him. That is what adoration is about, seeing God not as an object for our use, but as a person for our adoration. And the wonderful thing about worship, as we approach God in adoration, it changes us. Because not only do our hearts shift as we begin to look at God as someone to be adored and cherished and enjoyed and delighted in, but we begin to look at others in the same way. We begin to recognize that other people are created in the image of God. They are not the very representation of God's being as Jesus is. Yet they are a reflection of God. An image, however smudged, yeah. however messed up, still God's image. And in our worship, our hearts are conformed to God's so that we see them not as objects to serve our needs, but as reflections of God to be loved and delighted in. That is our invitation, to adore our God and to adore his image in others. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our profession of faith in response to hearing God's word comes from a, a document called Our Song of Hope. So let us profess our faith together. Our only hope is Jesus Christ. After we refuse to live in the image of God, he was born of the Virgin Mary, sharing our genes and our instincts, entering our culture, speaking our language, fulfilling the law of God. Being united to Christ's humanity, we know ourselves when we rest in him. Come, Lord Jesus, we are open to your spirit. We await your full presence. Our world finds rest in you alone. Amen. Okay. And as we prepare for our time of prayer together, what are those joys, what are those concerns that you might like to share that we can be lifting up as a church family? Boy, you know, some days, sometimes I have to sit there and wait. It's like, okay, yeah. And now so, whoosh, all these hands go off. This is great. <laughs> Linda. Uh, thankfulness, my daughter's uh, recovery was swift and excellent, and it allowed me to come and get a little Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So, and remind me of your daughter's name, Linda. So Linda's daughter, Anne, um, is uh, recovering well, and, uh, and that, is, that is a praise. Yeah. Teresa? So prayers for, uh, for the Krause's friend, John, who is on dialysis. And um, if you know anything about <laughs> dialysis, you know that's not a good thing. So, yeah, Pat. Oh, okay, so prayers for Fran uh, Shepherd, who's going in tomorrow. I had not heard from her. I will, I will give her a call. Okay. Yeah. Knee recovery? Did you say? Oh, okay. Sorry, I, I misheard. Okay, broken ankles. We, yeah. <laughs> yeah, relate to. Yeah. Okay. 
So, um, and what's your mom's name? Janet. Janet. So prayers for Janet, who is recovering from a, an auto injury, and in particular a broken ankle. Um, Lee. So our prayers for, um, for our daughter-in-law's father, Paul, who has cancer and his uh, uh, treatments are not going as well as one might hope. Yeah. Kathy? Yes, yeah. So our prayers for, uh, for John, who is recovering and dealing with a new normal as he recovers from a stroke. Yeah, Bob. Um, for those who make <laughs> yeah. So our prayers for those who uh, make decisions and those who are affected by those decisions when it comes to health care. Can. Um, Wonderful. Okay. Um, and can we pray a prayer of praise that Ken is now here and you guys are, are actually living as husband and wife and, <laughs> physically and not just you know, emotionally? Yeah. Katie. Okay, so prayers for Katie. One, a prayer of praise for her uh, friend and mentor, Jay, whose surgery went well uh, for finals coming up, and that, that goes for all our, our uh, students and, and teachers and professors who are dealing with that challenging time of the year. Uh, and then uh, just prayers of comfort and encouragement for uh, Katie's family as they uh, mourn the loss of her uncle. Yeah. Prayers for safe travels for everyone who is traveling. Yeah, Holly? That our athletic leaders would call the teachings of your servants for blessings and blessings. So our prayers for our uh, yeah, political leaders and, uh, and leaders in every other situation that they would focus on, on people as, as people and not as objects, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yes, yes. Okay. Anyone else this morning? Well, let us turn to God in prayer. Lord our God, uh, we rejoice to be in your presence. You who uh, made everything that is, uh, the earth, the stars, the planets, and us, uh, and this world that you've given us to live in. And uh, Lord, we ask that you help us to delight in, in you and in your presence uh, and delight in, in Jesus Christ, your son, and the opportunity to celebrate his birth and, and to look forward with anticipation to his return. God, we are grateful that we can come to you with our prayers, that we can give you thanks for uh, just all the ways in which you bring comfort and encouragement and healing into our lives. We thank you for the, uh, the ongoing recovery of, of Anne. And we thank you for uh, John's recovery. We pray that you be uh, with those who are uh, continuing to struggle with health issues, Lord. And we pray for, um, well, for Jay and, and for, uh, for Ben. We pray for uh, for Fran as she goes under surgery tomorrow, for Janet, for John. 
God, we give you thanks for uh, just things to celebrate. And we are especially thinking of Jocelyn's grandmother and, and her birth and that celebration of an event 92 years ago. God, we pray that you be with those who make decisions that affect others, whether they be uh, judges, whether they be political leaders, whether they be uh, teachers or parents. We ask, Lord, for wisdom and guidance and discernment that decisions are made based on the welfare of the other and not on our own purposes and needs. And God, we ask uh, just your protection for all those who are traveling at this holiday time of year. And we ask for, for uh, comfort and encouragement for those who uh, have nowhere to travel to and no one to celebrate with, Lord, or for those for whom the holidays are a difficult time. Help us all, Lord, to focus on what it is that we are celebrating, to look past the challenges and look, uh, look toward the joy that we have because of the Savior born to us, the Savior who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we uh, just continue our worship, let us take time to offer up from our, our resources, both those material resources that we put in the plate and those gifts of talents and time that we offer up to our God. So let us receive our offering with joy. child whose wish for Christmas lies far beyond what she can see
God, we thank you for bringing us to the season of faith, hope, and love. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let our acts of kindness as a church bear good fruit then in the world, and let earth receive her king, our king, Christ the Lord. Amen. Let us now sing the closing hymn, number 15, Rejoice, Rejoice, Believers. as we faithfully live our lives in the coming week, what does God call us to do? And brothers and sisters, as we go from this place, remember to be kind to yourself and good to your neighbor, keeping in mind that everyone you meet is carrying a heavy load, so let us go with God's blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest on and abide in us today and every day. Hallelujah and amen. <laughs>